I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 15. As we find ourselves in the summer months and we have visitors who are with us, we thank God that you're here. And just to give you some background, we are in a verse-by-verse study of the Gospel of Mark, and we find ourselves in Mark chapter 15, verse 1. We would commend to you to listen to any of the messages that are online that have preceded uh, this particular message, but we find ourselves at a very high watermark level of drama in those hours preceding the cross of our Lord as Jesus stands in the judgment and Jesus stands as he is being examined by Caiaphas, the Sanhedrin, and then Pilate. The title of this message is The Trial of Jesus Christ. This is part two. This day I want us to look at the first five verses of Mark chapter 15. Early in the morning, the chief priests and the elders and scribes and the whole council immediately held a consultation, and binding Jesus, they led him away and delivered him to Pilate. Pilate questioned him, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, it is as you say. The chief priests began to accuse him harshly, and Pilate questioned him again, saying, do you not answer? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer. So Pilate was amazed. We too should be amazed this day as we look at this account of our Lord standing in the judgment again. There are so many things that should amaze us about this. And we should be amazed that Him who is our advocate at the right hand of God the Father, who pleads our case for us, stands here without any advocacy whatsoever as He stands in the judgment. We should be amazed that Christ stands condemned here, that you and I would never stand condemned up there. And we should be amazed as Jesus stands in the judgment that you and I will never stand in the judgment with God. We should be amazed that Him who is perfect justice and perfect equity would be made to suffer so much injustice and so much inequity as He stands here. We should be amazed that the judge of heaven and earth who will preside over the eternal destiny of everyone here today would stand before human judges and such abuse of power would be hurled at him. We should be absolutely bewildered and astonished and amazed yet again that our Lord would so humble Himself as to stand in the judgment before unrighteous and ungodly men. May we this day, as we look yet again at this account, may our jaws drop. May we be bewildered that this was a part of the eternal purpose and plan for God the Father. This was a means to a far greater end. This was the chosen path that the Lord marked out for His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it was not an easy path. It was a path that was paved with much difficulty and much adversity. It was an excruciating path that the Father chose for the Son to take. And as we trod the will of God in this life, all of us must be reminded again that there are times of trials and tribulations that the Lord has marked out for us to traverse as well. 
But it is always for a higher purpose. It is always for a greater gain. None of us suffer adversity in this world needlessly. It is all by divine design. It is all drawn from infinite wisdom. And here it is with our Lord. It was a part of a greater master plan to bring about the salvation of all of God's people. There could be no greater glory brought to God than that there be a redeemed people around the throne who would worship God forever and ever. And this was a part of the means to that greater end. The same will be true in our lives as well. In the midst of good days, there will be difficult days. But it is all a means to a greater end that we would be conformed into the image of Him who suffered on our behalf. I want us to look yet again at the trial of Jesus Christ. Two weeks ago in Mark 14, we began this trial process in verse 53. And I told you then, and let me remind you, that there were six trials that our Lord underwent the night before and the morning of His crucifixion. There were three religious trials, and then there were three civil trials. And as we pick up the action in Mark 15, verse 1, we return to this trial narrative. Now, last time together in verses 66 through 72 of Mark 14, we saw the denial of Peter, which was a, a sidebar, if you will. We now step back into the continuous flow of this account of our Lord's trials that He underwent. And as we pick it back up, in chapter 15, verse 1, it will be the third and final phase of the religious trials, and then it will begin the initial trial settings of the civil or political trials before Rome. So, I want to give you four headings as we look at these verses. In verse 1, I want you to note the formal sentence in verse 2, the first interrogation. In verse 3, the false accusations. And in verses 4 and 5, the further questioning. I want to begin with the, the formal sentence, because this is how the religious trials before Annas and Caiaphas, the, the leaders of Israel, this is how the first of those phases concluded it was with a formal sentence. And so that is what we read in verse 1. Early in the morning. That would be about 6 a.m. in the morning at, at daybreak. The last we saw of our Lord was about 3 a.m. in the morning as He stood before Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin. We're not given an account of from 3 in the morning until 5 to 6 in the morning. It is reasonable to assume that Jesus would have been held in imprisonment somewhere in the palace of Caiaphas. The Sanhedrin is waiting for the sun to rise because of their meticulous desire to keep their oral tradition, their own little man-made laws which said no one can be put to capital punishment in a trial in the middle of the night. So they are the ultimate hypocrites who are straining at a net and swallowing a camel as they are blind to any sense of justice towards Christ, but they are now waiting for sunrise so that they will not break their own man-made regulations. So we read, in the early morning, the chief priests and the elders and scribes and the whole council immediately held a consultation. And this really represents what is known as the Sanhedrin. This is the ruling body of Israel. There are 70 or 71 or 72 members of the Sanhedrin, and they are comprised of these groups. The, the chief priests were the temple hierarchy, and they were mostly Sadducees who were the liberals of the day. They were uh, the political appointments of the day. 
And then there were the elders who were other members of the Sanhedrin. They were spiritual leaders in Israel. And then there were the scribes who were the authorities on the Jewish law. They were mostly Pharisees. And they were professional scholars who spent their life studying the Mosaic law, studying and explaining and applying the law to case study in Israel in individual situations. And so when he says the whole council, that was the gathering of the whole Sanhedrin. It says they immediately held a consultation. There's Mark's favorite word again, immediately, which means as soon it was, as it was sunrise, uh, there would be no wasting of daylight. They would immediately push forward this formal sentence of condemnation of our Lord. They would not wait till after breakfast. They would not wait till noon. There was blood in the water, and these sharks were going after the juggler vein of our Lord Jesus Christ. We read that they held a consultation. It really was just a formality. Their minds were already made up. They already knew what they were going to do. They were going to condemn him formally with this formal sentence, and then they would turn him over to Rome because they wanted the death penalty, and they did not have the authority to take someone's life. Only Rome could do that, but they would package our Lord and send him over to Pilate in such a way that Pilate would surely see the death penalty needs to come down and come down hard on the Lord Jesus Christ. They have sensed this is our moment. They are losing uh, popularity with the people. Uh, they are losing their stranglehold on their dead religion of their formal orthodoxy. They need to drive a stake into the heart of our Lord and Savior and be done with Him once and for all. Now, Mark gives us merely the Reader's Digest version. We just have it in verse 1. In order for this to be enlarged, I want you to turn with me to Luke's Gospel, to Luke chapter 2, to give a, a wide-angle lens to this formal sentence. No one of the four Gospels gives the entire accounting of these six trials, and you really have to piece all four Gospels together. And at this point in Mark's Gospel, we need the enlargement of Luke to see this third and final religious trial that our Lord suffered. So I want to network this together for you. And so in Luke 22, verse 61... This is Luke's expansion of the one verse in Mark 15, verse 1. So Luke 22. I must have said it wrong because I hear you still turning your pages. Luke 22, verse 66. So what did I say? Luke 2. That would be the Christmas account. <laughs> and uh, we need some background. In fact, come back to Genesis, if you would. <laughs> We're going to get a running start at this. No, uh, Luke 22. Sorry. Verse 66. Now, notice how verse 66 begins. It begins immediately, uh, excuse me, exactly like Mark 15, verse 1. When it was day. The first two phases took place in the night. This tells us this is the third and final phase. Verse 66, when it was day. The council of elders of the people assembled, both chief priests and scribes. That's exactly what Mark 15, verse 1 says. And they led him, Jesus, away to their council chamber, saying... Now, verse 67, they pose the question. Now, we looked at this very same question two weeks ago. If you are the, if you are the Christ, tell us. That question has already been posed to Christ. It is now asked a second time in this third phase for the mere formality for Jesus to indict himself with his own words. And they are not asking this so that they can put their faith and their trust in him. They are wanting Jesus with his own answer 
to enter into the public record his own self-condemnation. And so in verse 67, if you are the Christ, tell us. Their minds are already made up. They, they have repudiated all of his charges to be the Christ. That's why they're after him. But they now answer the question, or they ask the question, so that Jesus will be forced to ask it, answer it yet again. But he said to them, if I tell you, you will not believe. Now, Jesus gives substantially the very same answer that he had given before, but Jesus acknowledges to them, it's useless for me to answer because you will not believe in me. In other words, they are saying, my mind is already made up. Don't confuse me with the facts. Verse 68, Jesus said, and if I ask a question, you will not answer. Well, there's much Jesus could have asked of them, and they would have been entangled and entrapped by their own answers. But Jesus knows that it is futile to enter into to dialogue with them. In fact, it will be like casting pearls before swine for Jesus to engage any further in this. So verse 69, this is all that Jesus answers, and it is exactly what He has already answered. He gives the very same response. Verse 69, but from now on, and now he quotes Daniel 7, 13 and 14. The Son of Man, so Jesus is claiming to be the Son of Man. They said, are you the Christ? And he acknowledges, oh, I'm more than the Christ. I am the Son of Man. I am more than just the Messiah who has come in the power of the Holy Spirit to usher in the kingdom of God. I, as Messiah, am God in human flesh. From now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power on high. This is boldness. This is courage beyond description. For Jesus now to go beyond just saying, yes, I am the Christ, Jesus now boldly looks beyond His death that they will be the means of bringing about. And Jesus sees His resurrection, His ascension, His exaltation, His coronation, and His sovereign reign over heaven and earth. That's what He says to them. He's not looking for common ground. He's looking for higher ground. This is such a bold answer in verse 69 that Jesus gives. And in essence, He is saying... Presently, I am standing in your judgment hall, but the day is coming when you will stand in my judgment hall. Presently, I am giving an account to you, but on the last day, at the right hand of God the Father, you will answer to me, and I will be there in great power, the power of God. This is a, an extraordinary testimony that Jesus is giving under oath in their courtroom. Verse 70, and they all said, you are the Son of God then. How blind can blind be? He just said it. And the reason they ask it again is so that among the 70 members of the Sanhedrin, there will be no doubt in anyone's mind what he has said. He is hanging himself. This is a charge worthy of blasphemy. He is claiming to be God. He is claiming to be the Son of God. He is claiming to be co-equal and co-eternal with God. Are you the Son of God then? And He said to them, Yes, I am. Verse 71, Then they said, What further need do we have 
of testimony. There's no more questions we need to ask the defendant. He has already slit his own veins. He has already condemned himself. He claims to be the Son of God, the Son of Man. For he says in verse, in verse 71, for we have heard it ourselves from his own mouth. They now have the evidence in hand to put him away for good. This brings now to conclusion the formal sentence. So come back to Mark 15, verse 1. And I want you to see the end of verse 1, how they now respond to what Luke has recorded for us. Having now received from his own lips his own indicting profession, we read, and binding Jesus. This is what they would do to a guilty criminal who has been found to be a lawbreaker, they would issue the formal sentence which was blasphemy against God and heresy against the Word of God. And so they bind him as a condemned man, and we read, and they led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. They would have now left Pilate, uh, uh, Caiaphas's palace, and all 70-plus of the Sanhedrin proceeded through the streets of Jerusalem to the praetorium where Pilate was residing. Uh, Pilate lived for most of the year in Caesarea on the Mediterranean Sea, and on special uh, festival occasions, he would move his headquarters to Jerusalem just to keep an eye on things so that there would be no uprising as all of the thousands of people would pour into Jerusalem. And that is what has happened for this Passover. Pilate, who lives elsewhere, is now on site, and he is in the praetorium. The word praetorium means the headquarters where they will deliver over Jesus, bound to Him to condemn him and to crucify him. Pilate was the Roman governor of Judea. He was a harsh governor who despised the Jews. And he was no man that you would want to stand before. And all of this is in fulfillment of the very words that Christ had spoken earlier. In Mark chapter 10, verse 33, which we looked at some time ago, Jesus forewarned His disciples that all of this would take place, including this, that He would be turned over by the Jewish leaders to the political authorities of Rome. None of this has caught Jesus by surprise. This was all prescripted by God. And in Mark 10, verse 33, Jesus had said, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn Him to death and will hand Him over to the Gentiles and hand Him over to the Gentiles. The reason is crystal clear. So that they will do what they, what, so that the Gentiles will do what they, as the Jewish leaders, cannot do, is to send the death sentence with authority upon Christ. So I want you to notice now, second, not only the formal sentence. But now the first interrogation in verse 2. The first interrogation of the, the Roman leader, Pilate. This now starts phase 2 of our Lord's trials. 
The religious trials are over, phase one, three parts. Now begins phase two, the religious trials of Christ, or excuse me, the civil trials of Christ, and it too will come in three parts. So verse two we read, Pilate questioned him, are you the king of the Jews? Now what we need to know at this point is that there is no jury, there is only a judge. And that judge is Pilate. And in the hands of Pilate has been invested by Caesar the authority of life and death. It is all found in one man, and he will use that authority to make an example out of anyone in order to suppress any kind of uprising among the Jews. The last thing that that Pilate would want to get back to Caesar is that things are out of control in Jerusalem. And so Pilate will wield the sword, he will wield his authority and, and go to any length to save his own political career and he will make an example out of anyone. And so we read in verse 2, Pilate now begins his questioning. Now in order to understand this questioning, which is only one verse in Mark, that's the Reader Digest version, I want you to turn to John's Gospel. John chapter 18, and I want you to see the enlarged account of what takes place in this first interrogation. John chapter 18, and I want to begin in verse 28 as John will give us a fuller treatment of this question. So we read in John 18 and verse 28, then they led Jesus from Caiaphas into the praetorium and it was early. You see how that interconnects. It was early, it was 6 a.m., in the morning, they led Jesus away, that is the Sanhedrin, the Jewish leaders, and they walk through the streets of Jerusalem to an area north of the temple area to where the praetorium was. And when they arrive with Jesus bound as a, as a loathsome criminal, we read, they themselves did not enter into the praetorium so that they would not be defiled but might eat the Passover. You see how legalists and legalism major on minors and minor on majors? Legalism, in fact, majors on things that aren't even minors. And they just invent their own little world in which they live of what spirituality would be and what what would godliness be? And they've come up with these own rules that they cannot enter into a building with Gentiles. And so as they have conducted this kangaroo court to indict the most, the only perfect man who has ever lived on the earth, when they deliver him over, they are as blind as blind can be, and they will not go into the building for fear that they would violate a law and become defiled. They're like fish who are swimming in water and don't, can't even feel that they're wet. They are so inundated with their own hypocrisy and duplicity and the corruption of their own hearts. Jesus has already described them in Matthew chapter 23 as those who clean the outside of the cup, but the inside of the cup is never clean. Oh, their outward facade, the veneer of their religiosity, they dressed up well when they came into the temple. They looked good, sounded good, but they never cleaned out their hearts. Jesus referred to them as whitewashed sepulchers, tombstones that are painted white on the outside, and it looks so great, but down on the inside of their hearts, they are nothing but dead men's bones. They are spiritual corpses. That is what we see here in verse 28. They are straining at a gnat and swallowing a camel. Jesus would say elsewhere. And so they deliver up Jesus to Pilate at the praetorium. 
But they will not walk inside the building lest they ceremonially defile themselves and be unfit to take the Passover while they seek the death of the Passover lamb. How blind can blind be? So verse 29, Therefore Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? We can see Pilate standing on the front porch in the front steps of the praetorium with with all of its majesty and with all of its architectural beauty as he stands there and the Sanhedrin are there and he says, What accusation do you bring against this man? What are the formal charges? Verse 30, they answered and said to him, Now, you talk about a total non-answer. Listen to this answer. They ought to be fired for such incompetence. If this man were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him to you. (laughs) Talk about evasive. Great politicians. What are the charges? Well, we wouldn't offer him up to you if there weren't plenty of them. So verse 31, Pilate, who's a pretty shrewd operator himself, said to them, take him yourselves and judge him according to your own law. In other words, this is a fight between, this is an in-house fight. You decide. This is a, a Jewish matter. This pertains to your nation. You try him. You decide. The Jews said to him, now this really gets at the issue. We are not permitted to put anyone to death. That's the whole issue. That's why we're here. That's why he is bound. That's why all seven of us, 70 of us are here. That's why we're calling for the death penalty If we try him ourselves, all we can do is excommunicate him. All we can do is discipline him. All we can do is slap his wrists. We want you to slit his wrists. You have the authority under Caesar to bring about capital punishment. Verse 32, to fulfill the word of Jesus which he spoke signifying by what kind of death He was about to die. If the Jews had done this under the Mosaic law, they would have killed him in one of two ways. They would have either stoned him to death or they would have pushed him over the edge of a cliff. But Jesus said in John 3, 14 and in John 8, 28 and in John 12, 32 and 33 that in his death he must be lifted up. And so all of this is being providentially controlled by God that Rome would be in charge so that Jesus would die not by stoning to death or being pushed off of a mountain, but that He would be put to death by being lifted up. And we understand that meaning being lifted up upon a cross. So verse 33, therefore Pilate entered again into the praetorium. He leaves the 70 on the front steps of the praetorium and he turns around and he walks back in where Jesus is so that he can have one-on-one, face-to-face interrogation. And said to him, are you the king of the Jews? That is what is in Mark 15 verse 2. Are you the king of the Jews? Now, when Pilate says this, Pilate is not saying this spiritually, religiously. King of the Jews. He is saying this politically. Meaning, are you a rival king to Caesar? Are you a king who will seek to overthrow Roman occupancy in Judea? Are you a king with an army? Are you a king over a kingdom 
that has military force that will overthrow my jurisdiction. Are you the king of the Jews? Verse 34, Jesus answered, this is so insightful. This one sentence from Jesus just opens up the entire matter. Are you saying this on your own initiative? Or did others tell you about me? Now, here is the impact of that question. It may not immediately be seen on the surface. Pilate was saying, are you asking this on your own initiative, meaning from your own perspective, meaning are you a political king over a national kingdom? Or have these others put you up to asking this from their perspective, which is that I would be a false Messiah who has come to preside over people's thinking and over their hearts. That's what's behind verse 34. Are you asking this wanting to find out about a political national kingdom or a spiritual religious kingdom? Verse 35, Pilate understood. I'm not a Jew. Now, why would he say that? I mean, I'm not looking at this like a Jew. I could care less about your little messiahships and, and your little spiritual kingdoms. I'm not a Jew. I'm a, I'm a Roman. And all Rome cares about is political, national borders and armies and entities. I am not a Jew, am I? If your own nation and the chief priest delivered you to me, what have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world, which is to say my kingdom is not a political kingdom, it is not a military kingdom, it is not a nationalistic kingdom, it is not a kingdom that has arisen out of this evil world system. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. In other words, if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would be soldiers. They wouldn't be carrying Bibles around. They would be carrying arrows and shields and, and to try to take over. And so Jesus would pose no threat to Pilate because his kingdom is not of this world and his followers will not fight Rome. But as it is, the end of verse 36, my kingdom, Jesus reinforces this, is not of this realm. Jesus' kingdom will not be advanced by force, but by faith. It would not be a political kingdom, it would be a spiritual kingdom. But by saying this, when Jesus says, my kingdom, in verse 36, this does clearly imply that Jesus is claiming to be a king. It's just that He is a king over a totally different kind of kingdom that, Pilate, you would understand. Verse 37, therefore Pilate said to him, so you are a king. So you are claiming to preside over a kingdom. Pilate is simply confused over the nature of the kingdom. Jesus answered, you say correctly that I am a king. 
Jesus is saying, yes, I am a sovereign. I rule over a kingdom, and I have subjects under my domain over whom I rule. Jesus then said, for this I have been born. I have entered into this world not to enlist soldiers to fight against Rome. I have been born to establish a spiritual kingdom that is an eternal kingdom, and I will rule and reign in their hearts and in their souls. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world. This is my reason for the incarnation. It is salvific to testify to the truth. Jesus' kingdom is built upon the truth. Jesus' kingdom is advanced by the truth about God, the truth about man, the truth about sin, the truth about grace, the truth about eternity, the truth about heaven, the truth about hell, the truth about the final judgment. The kingdom of God is built upon the truth. Let me remind you what the truth is. Truth is reality. Truth is the way things really are. Truth is the way things are as God defines anything. And then Jesus says this. This is a knockout punch. Everyone who is of the truth. That means everyone who is born of the truth. Everyone who has received the truth. Everyone who has embraced the truth. Everyone who owns the truth. Everyone who possesses the truth. Here's my Now, Pilate heard audible sound, but he could not hear the truth in his heart. Because the Holy Spirit of God must open the ears to hear the truth. And those who are of the truth are those who have heard the truth, really heard the truth. And those who are in the kingdom and those who have Christ as their king are those who are of the truth. What an interaction this is that is going on between Pilate and Jesus. Who do you think is in charge of this interrogation? On paper, it's Pilate. In reality, it is Jesus. Verse 38, Pilate said to him, What is truth? He's not saying this as some so-called seeker. I want to know the truth. Oh, please tell me the truth. He is saying this with a sneer of sarcasm. He is saying this with cynicism. Pilate is the ultimate skeptic. There is no truth. There is no absolute truth. Yeah, what is truth? Everybody says they've got a market on the truth. For Pilate, truth is whatever works. For Pilate, truth is whatever is his own experience, whatever makes it happen for him at that moment. Truth is vacillating. Truth is is diverse. It is different for different people. Yeah, what is truth? As far as Pilate is concerned, Jesus is just one more voice talking about truth. All Pilate cares about is that Jesus does not have armed soldiers who will rise up and try to overthrow his control of Judea and put his neck on the altar under Caesar. You can talk about truth from here until the cows come home. You can talk about religion. You can talk about what is spiritual. You can talk about... uh, a spiritual kingdom, all you want. I don't care. Just don't lead 
a political advance. Let's look at the end of verse 38. This is very important to understand the unfolding of, of this trial that our Lord is, has undergone. Look at the end of verse 38. And when he had said this, when Pilate had said this, ah, what is truth? He went out again to the Jews. The Jews here refers to the Jewish leaders. In other words, the Sanhedrin, the chief priests, the elders, the scribes. Remember, it's still just past 6 a.m. in the morning. It's still early. It's still sunrise. And said to them, I find no guilt in him. This is going to create a problem for the Jewish leaders. We just have delivered to him, we have just delivered him to you, signed, sealed, and delivered. And now you're coming back out to say to us, you find no guilt in him? And they are met with a total stone wall at this point. All right, come back to Mark 15. I've got just a couple of minutes. Come back now to Mark 15, verse 3. John 18 has enlarged verse 2. Luke 22 has enlarged verse 1. Now verse 3. No doubt we can, we can see the the chief priests and the elders and the scribes and the Pharisees as they now huddle up among themselves as if to say, now what are we going to do? Pilate just said, I find no guilt in him. So they conspire among themselves. And they said, we're going to have to start throwing mud on the back wall. Something is going to have to stick. And so, in verse 3, I want you to see the false charges. Verse 3, the chief priests began to accuse him harshly, meaning the venom began to spew from their mouth as they began to slander Christ and, 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 and ridicule Christ in front of Pilate, but more than harshly, they were doing it falsely. You say, well, what were they saying? Mark doesn't tell us, but Luke does. So turn back, if you would, to Luke 23. Luke 23 and verse 2. It's just one verse. But I want you to see the false charges that were being brought now by the Jews. There are three, and they are so diabolically brilliant. They know if we present religious reasons or spiritual reasons to Pilate, Pilate could care less. For them to talk about blasphemy against God and heresy against uh, the Word of God, that doesn't mean anything to Pilate. So they are ingenious in that they know they will have to concoct political reasons. They are excellent salesmen. They know how to sell their product. They know how to hit the right hot button. So here are the three false charges that they bring, Luke 23, verse 2. And they began to accuse him, Jesus saying, here's number one, we found this man to be misleading our nation that has grave political and national overtones, nation. If this man, in other words, continues to teach, there's going to be a revolution in the streets. 
He is misleading this nation. He is taking us in a totally different direction. He is going to sink the nation. They know that that will hit Pilate on his hot button. Then here's the second. Oh, this really is hitting below the belt now. And forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar. It's the economy, stupid. It's all about money. It's all about the national coffers. It's all about how much money does the nation rake in and how much money, Caesar, are you going to be able to bilk out of the people and send back to Rome so that you will be a hero in the eyes of Caesar? This man is forbidding his followers to pay taxes. Caesar is not going to like to hear this. But the income is down. And back then, they couldn't print money. Now, Jesus has already addressed this. You remember, they brought him a coin and says, they said, who should we give this to? And they, Jesus ingeniously said, well, whose image is on that coin? They said, Caesar's. And Jesus said, well, render to Caesar what is Caesar's. Now, Jesus has not told his followers, do not pay your taxes. Jesus has reinforced, you give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. These are false, trumped-up charges that they are bringing against the Lord Jesus Christ, but they are going at an area that they know that Pilate will be vitally interested in. The direction of this nation and the economic giving in taxes to Caesar. And then third, and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. And they come back to this issue that Jesus claims to be a king, but what they are saying is, is that Jesus is sedacious to Rome. He is sedacious against Rome. He is leading an uprising and a rebellion and a revolution in the streets against you and against Rome. He is a king. Don't let him tell you he is not a king. He sees himself as a king. And if you let this go on any longer, Pilate, you're no longer in charge. There's a new sheriff in town. There is a new king. And he will be sitting in the praetorium if you don't do something about this now. So look finally in verse 4 at the further questioning. Then Pilate questioned him again, saying, Do you not answer? I find no guilt in you, but you need to say something. Speak up, defend yourself. Now's your chance. Can't you see I'm actually trying to help you? Accused prisoners always deny charges. But instead, our Lord remains silent. He does not answer. Jesus did not defend himself. Jesus did not rebuttal their false charges. He did not turn against them with charges of his own. He did not have to to come out on top. He did not have to appear to be right. He didn't have to have the last word. He didn't even have the first word. He offers no self-defense and no self-vindication. He is now simply silent. And the silence is deafening. And the silence is screaming at Pilate. 
Paul says, see how many charges they bring against you? Verse 5, but Jesus made no further answer. This is inexplicable for Pilate. Every other accused man has been vocal and loud and desperate and screaming and threatening. And Jesus is quiet. He is controlled. He is dignified. He is serene. And we read, so Pilate was amazed. Pilate was not insulted. Pilate was amazed. He was astonished. No one has ever acted like this in his judgment hall. No, no matter what the threat, no matter how much he rattles the saber, Pilate was dumbfounded that Jesus offered no self-defense. What do we take from this? Number one, the infallibility of Scripture. It had been prophesied 700 years earlier in Isaiah 53, verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep before, like a sh sheep that is silent before his shears, so he did not open his mouth mouth. We see in this the infallibility of Scripture, that all that God has said in His Word will surely come to pass just as God has said. The grass withers, the flower fades away, but the Word of our God abides forever. Any place you open your Bible, you see pure unadulterated truth that is uncontaminated with any flaw or any error. Second, we see the virtue of meekness. We see demonstrated the godly quality of humility. We see the virtuous quality of a gentle and quiet spirit. 1 Peter 2 speaks directly to this in quotes from this. For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving an example for you to follow in His steps. What is the example for us to follow? He now quotes Isaiah 53 who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. This does not mean that if we are put in a court of law that we cannot testify for ourselves. This does not mean that there does not come a time and a place where we have to defend ourselves before others. There does come such a place. Second Corinthians is Paul's self-defense of his apostleship. But there is to be in our hearts and lives what we see exemplified in Jesus in the judgment hall, a meekness and a lowliness of heart that is precious in the sight of God. J.C. Ryle writes, nothing in the Christian character glorifies God so much as patient suffering. Close quote. Are you a patient sufferer when you suffer unjustly? When there are false accusations brought against you? When the full story is not told and you are left in a state of being condemned by others? 
Is there a willingness for the greater glory of God at times to turn the other cheek and to simply be quiet in the face of your accusers? Peter says, we have an example in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then finally, we see in this the speechlessness of sinners. Jesus now is beginning to stand in the judgment for us. He is not yet to the cross, and He has not yet become sin for us. But the shadows of the cross are falling across this judgment hall, and Jesus is beginning to stand in our place for us. And when sinners stand before God on the last day, every mouth will be shut. And there will be no excuses given by the sinner to God as they are condemned by a holy God. Romans 3.19 says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be be closed. You remember the man who tried to go into the king's banquet without taking on the king's garments? And he plunged his way in, and they found him, and they came to him, and they said, why haven't you put on the king's garments? And the man was speechless. If you die without Christ, and when you stand before God, you too will be absolutely mute. What would you say? What excuse would you offer? I never heard. I never knew. You will be speechless, just as Jesus is speechless, as He is now beginning to stand in our place under not just the judgment of Pilate, but under the judgment of God. Have you put your faith in Christ? Have you put your hope in Him? He has been condemned so that you need never be condemned. But you must be found in Him. You must repent of your sin, O sinner. You must come to Him and do business You will find him to be a friend of sinners. You will find that those who come to him, he will in no wise cast out. He will deal gently with you. But you must come to him. And you must repent. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we do repent. I trust that we are repenters. We thank you for our Savior. We do not know what else to say. Thank you for giving to us one so patient in his suffering. In Jesus' name, amen. Because of the time, I think that We will forsake the singing of the last song. Men, if you would come as we take our offering, and we will be very soon dismissed. Men, would you come, and then you can play as we take the offering. Father, as we now take this offering, our mind and our thoughts are still upon our Savior. As we give, I trust that we give with His patient suffering for us, very deeply impressed upon our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.